just making sure I've not got any bogeys before we get started. Honestly guys, I have actually been so so sick. I don't know if it's all the paint fumes from the redecorating or what. <laughs> Hey there guys, my name's Megan if you're new here and if not, welcome back for another spooky episode of Killer Weekend where each week we'll discuss a true crime case and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. If you like all things true crime, supernatural, UFO, conspiracy theory and all that good stuff in between then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you each week with our true crime crime killer weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our weirdo Wednesdays where we'll discuss something spooky I've heard. And remember, if you have nothing nice to say, this is what I want you to do. Any questions? I will leave a small disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. It does involve details of postnatal dissociative disorders and also the death of an infant. If that's a trigger point for you, then please feel free to turn away now. But before we dive into this week's episode, let me introduce you to this week's incredible sponsor. It's HelloFresh. As you may know by now, we are a proud HelloFresh household. So when that beautiful little recyclable box arrives, it's like the happiest day of the week for me. Each meal is packaged separately and comes with its own recipe card to make things as simple as possible. HelloFresh does all the hard work for you as all the ingredients you need are pre-portioned and ready to go. Since January, I've been trying hard to eat right, especially now that the wedding is only eight months away. But with HelloFresh's calorie smart options, it doesn't feel like a chore anymore. Have you been struggling to keep up with your fitness goals? Do those takeout menus call to you in the night? Well babe, it's time to hang up the phone and I promise you, you will be shocked with how much money you save when you ditch the fast food for HelloFresh. I've converted my whole family into HelloFreshers and no matter your lifestyle, there will be an option best suited to you. With over 40 recipes available each week, you can choose something from the new Fast and Fresh range if you're a parent on the go, or just stock up on the snacks if you're planning a cosy Friday night at home. Tonight, we're in the mood for one of our favourites, and we have tried the spicy, creamy Cajun chicken pasta before, and it is to die for. No pun intended. I say this all the time, but I was not the most confident cook, and now I actually get excited to join in in the fun. The food is always delicious and super fresh, so you know it's coming straight from the farm to to your front door. Seriously, my mouth is watering from all this tasty food chat, so let's do the taste test. Gremlins, now is the time to dig out your apron and your oven mitts and try something new. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code 65MEGAN for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com and use code 65MEGAN for 65% off plus free shipping. Happy cooking! Hello! Hello. Apologies, I may have had a Red Bull or two. As you may have noticed, we are filming in a bit of a strange location today, so I apologise if anything's off with the lighting or the audio. I am refurbing my filming studio, so we will do a wee tour when it's all ready to go. Okay, so today we're going to jump in the DeLorean and journey back to the 1990s. Let me set the scene. It's a Friday night and you pick up the phone to call your girlfriend. Not on your new new shiny iPhone, no no, on your sexy clear plastic telephone with multicoloured wires. In the 90s tanning beds were the moment, as was that weird twisty hairdo that we all thought was the dog's bollocks. It really was not. Speaking of dogs, if you were lucky enough, your parents might have bought a family pet. But if not, you could always get 
a Tamagotchi. But be warned, if you didn't pick up its virtual shit quick enough, your 2D pal would pack its bags and leave. Just like Ginger left the Spice Girls. So yeah, there was a lot going on, but it was also around this time that a disturbing rumour started circulating around high schools in the US. This rumour would take on a life of its own, and soon it morphed into a pretty nasty urban legend. But when compared to other tales such as The Kidney Heist and Pop Rocks, who could forget that one, this legend had one big difference. It was 100% true. Tonight, everyone, we will be discussing the true crime story of Melissa Drexler, aka The Prom Mom. The Friday of June 6, 1997 was a big night for the high school seniors of Lacey Township High School in New Jersey. Donning their ball gowns and penguin tuxedos, they headed in to the Garden Manor Banquet Hall in nearby Aberdeen. Like most teens, the students had been very excited about their high school prom. The theme that year was I'll Always Remember You. Which is ironic because it would turn out to be a night that no one would ever forget. As the couple stopped by the entrance, posing to have their photograph taken with their sweethearts, some troublemakers spike the punch. Just your typical senior prom. A few girls huddled around the bathroom mirrors, fixing their lipstick and sneaking a swig of vodka they'd stolen from their father's stash. Amongst their chatter, a couple of the girls could hear grunting coming from one of the stalls. They were thinking, Jesus Christ, it had only been 25 minutes since the prom started and already two kids were at it in the toilets. And who says romance is dead? The girls, now extremely curious and giggling profusely, decide to take a peek at the young lovers. However, when they look under the cubicle door, they're shocked to see bright crimson blood dripping onto the floor. Terrified, they run out in horror, grabbing the first teacher they could find. But whose blood was that? And would they make it to their high school graduation alive? Melissa A. Drexler, born on the 10th of July 1978, was raised an only child in Forkid River within Lacey Township, New Jersey. Life in the tight-knit community of only 5,000 residents was fairly uneventful. Melissa's mother Marie worked at the local bank and her father was a shipping clerk for an importing company. Together, their paychecks afforded the couple a nice house in a middle-class neighbourhood. Melissa's parents believed in strong Christian values and they expected the same from their only daughter. Growing up, she was a quiet girl who didn't find it easy to socialise. However, in the fourth grade, Melissa met Rebecca Ginelli and the two were inseparable after that. The girls even attended dance class together, where Melissa excelled at modern jazz. Whilst a student at Lacey Township High School, Melissa maintained a small circle of close friends. Her classmates would describe her as average. She was never the popular girl, and despite her studious reputation, her grades were always just okay. Those closest to her would say that she was a supportive friend, really mellow, and a caring parent. Person. However, she was different from the rest of her girlfriends. Melissa was always very composed. She rarely showed emotion and most of the time she responded in small smiles and subtle frowns. She never got upset and it appeared as though she didn't mind helping other people with their problems as long as she didn't have to talk about her own. Back in the mid-90s, teenagers didn't have Netflix, social media and the best video game that money could buy was hardly high tech. 
So most weekends, Melissa and her girls would hit up Ocean County Mall or take a stroll down Seaside Park Boardwalk, anything to get out of Four Kid River. Melissa loved bowling and chatting to her friends on the phone while she painted her nails. And I know you're probably thinking, she sounds like a normal 90s teenager. True. But Melissa also had a very secretive side. At the age of 16, she met 18 year old John Lewis, not the department store, whilst over at her best pal Rebecca's house. Rebecca would later recall that fateful encounter. She said that it wasn't anything like love at first sight or sparks flying but you could tell that John liked Melissa. Those who knew the couple described their relationship as a slow burner and very wishy-washy. The two broke up a lot and no one expected it to last past high school. In her final year of school, Melissa had created a world in which she could still see John every day without having to explain where she was to her strict Catholic parents. After attending her morning classes, she would head over to John's house telling mum and dad that she was at the library or a friend's house instead. This way she could stay with John all day until he had to go to work at a local supermarket at 7pm. Marie and John had no clue that she was spending 90% of her time with her older boyfriend. Melissa was always home in time for dinner so why would they worry? Melissa's best friends would later claim that she was very close to her mother despite her secret life. The two would head to amusement parks and the local shopping mall for girls' days out. Now, lying about sneaking off to shack up with an older boy is not a cardinal sin, but considering what happens next, I can't help but see Melissa's ability to compartmentalise her life as a warning sign of things to come. In the late fall of 1996, Melissa noticed that her period was abnormally late. She'd never been late in her life. Something wasn't right. Another month went by, but still no sign of old Aunt Flo. She panicked. Was she pregnant? Surely not. In November that year, Melissa pulled John aside for a private chat. She said that her period was late and that she could be carrying his child. Initially, John was taken aback. She'd always told him that she was on the pill, which in fact was a complete lie. When he questioned her on that, Melissa laughed the skate off as a false alarm and claimed that she must have got her dates mixed up. But there was no mix up. In fact, Melissa Drexler was eight weeks pregnant, whether she wanted to admit it or not. In the months that followed, Melissa was her old self. However, some friends did notice a couple of changes after she'd returned from winter break. At lunch, she was eating some weird ass foods and she appeared to be eating more than usual constantly snacking. Because of this, her recent weight gain made sense, which she concealed wearing baggy jeans and sweatshirts. Her friend Sarah Doric ate lunch with her every single day and later would say that she remembered nothing suspicious about Melissa's behaviour. As spring approached, the senior girls started prepping for their upcoming prom that June. Whilst out dress shopping with bestie Rebecca, Melissa settled on a black velvet floor-length form-fitting gown. Rebecca and her mother Lynn later recalled that Melissa tried on several skin-tight mini dresses that day and neither of them saw any hint of a belly. Melissa, who was five foot seven in height, had looked a little bit chubbier than usual but it was nothing for her friends to be concerned about. Much like the rest of her school pals, she appeared to be excited about the dance and for her future after high school ended. She'd even lined up a summer job as a sales assistant for a clothing store situated on the beachfront. Melissa had always loved clothes and fashion and she dreamed of travelling to New York City and becoming a famous designer. Unfortunately, her grades didn't exactly match her enthusiasm and so she settled on Brookdale Community College only 45 minutes from home. Loved ones said that Melissa was a talented sketch artist but 
her written work wasn't the best. Maybe that's because the pretty high school senior's mind was focused on other things, like the tiny fetus growing inside her tummy. The morning of June 6, 1997 rolled in and the students of Lacey Township High School whizzed about town getting all dolled up for their last big dance. Melissa, much like her girlfriends, was very busy herself with a trip to the local hairdresser scheduled that afternoon. However, she started to experience severe abdominal cramps and in only a couple of hours, the real reason behind her bizarre cravings and fuller figure could no longer be ignored. That evening, Melissa, her boyfriend John, bestie Rebecca and a couple of other kids from their school head to the Garden Manor Banquet Hall in Aberdeen in a stretch limousine. The 50-minute drive seemed to be too much for 18-year-old Melissa as throughout the journey, she suffered from some sort of weird spasm. By the time the limo pulled into the parking lot, she was sweating and breathing heavily. Rebecca asked if she was okay because she certainly didn't look it, to which Melissa responded that she was fine, just suffering from some really bad period cramps. When in reality, Melissa hadn't had a period in nine months and those cramps were actually contractions. As the group entered the venue, Melissa darted off into the ladies' room. Fellow students remembered her glamorous velvet gown and sleek updo. But within the hour, she'd be remembered for a much more sinister reason. Now in full labour, Melissa took position behind a locked cubicle door. The pain took over and other students could hear a faint grunting sound, which they dismissed as a young couple getting jiggy with it. After around 15 to 20 minutes, Rebecca came in to check on her friend. Melissa yelled out that she was fine, she'd be done, and to tell the boys she'd be right out. Once Rebecca left the loo, Melissa began pushing. This child was coming, whether she wanted it to or not. Again, her moans alert another group of teenage girls to her bathroom stall. They bend down to take a look at what sounds like a pair of horny teens, only to see blood dripping down the white porcelain bowl onto the floor. The girls knew it was Melissa Drexler because she actually kicked her foot out, trying to wipe up the blood with her shoe. Little did they know that Melissa, their fellow classmate, had just given birth to a baby boy. Moments later, she emerges from the bathroom, leaving a bloody mess behind. According to John and Rebecca, she was totally okay. She ate a salad, had some punch, and even got down on the dance floor. Sometime after the incident, she strutted up to the DJ booth and asked if he would play Metallica's Unforgiven. Meanwhile, chaperones and faculty members started hearing about the disturbing scene in the toilets. A bathroom attendant is sent into the ladies room to clean up the stall, but this is beyond her pay grade. Now, this just isn't a little bit of blood. We're talking smears up the wall, splashed all over the floor, and inside the toilet, it looks like human tissue. This is more like a crime scene, so the attendant informs informs teachers of the gravity of the situation and starts trying to clean up the mess. She's finishing up, putting the paper towels into the rubbish bin when she notices it's full. So, innocently, she thinks to herself, well, I might as well empty the trash while I'm here. But when she goes to lift the bag, it feels heavy, abnormally heavy. The female attendant is getting bad vibes so she grabs a nearby maintenance man and the two begin to tear into the bag together only to discover another trash bag which has been tied in a knot. They start untying the knot totally unprepared for what they're about to find inside. As all this is happening, Melissa is approached by prom organizers about the gore she's left behind in the loo. She's dismissive at first, stating that everything's okay, it was just a really bad period, 
And they're like, baby girl, no, it looks like Freddy Krueger's boiler room in there. So they pull her for a private chat. Moments later, EMTs would arrive at the Garden Manor Banquet Hall, shocking students and leaving them wondering if someone had gone a little bit too hard on the hooch. Sadly, the reality was so much worse because inside those trash bags that felt a little bit too weighty was a non-responsive newborn baby boy. Faculty members spoke to Melissa and John separately as news of the horrific discovery filtered through the other students. John seems genuinely shocked. He's in complete disbelief and promises he had no idea that Melissa was pregnant. Like most of her girlfriends, he admitted she'd been a little bit curvier of late, but that she couldn't be pregnant and that this must be some sort of mistake, a sentiment that Melissa's parents shared. Once she finally came clean that the child was indeed hers, Melissa was rushed to Bayshore Community Hospital in Holmdale, New Jersey. Her parents, John and Marie, were just enjoying a quiet Friday night at home when they received the call telling them their teenage daughter had just given birth at her prom. They agreed to go to the hospital, if only to set the record straight and put all this nonsense to a stop. However, when they saw their little girl sitting on that hospital bed as white as a sheet, they couldn't pretend anymore. It was time to face the music. Back at the prom, things took a turn for the worst as paramedics worked for two hours on the six pound, six ounce baby boy. But it was too late. He was already gone. An autopsy was carried out on his tiny corpse and Assistant County Medical Examiner Dr J Peacock discovered some red flags. Air found in the infant's intestines and trauma to the airways would prove that the child wasn't stillborn as Melissa had claimed. Nope, he had died due to asphyxia, manual strangulation and obstruction of the external airway orifices. Melissa's baby had been murdered. In an instant, Melissa Drexler went from innocent victim to cold-blooded baby killer. It of course wasn't long before the US media caught wind of this wild story. Melissa's friends and family were hounded for interviews and the teen was nicknamed the prom mom. The public outcry was deafening, with some students making their feelings known by graffitiing Melissa's locker and the walls with words such as baby killer and slut. Lacey Township faculty members also received their fair share of scrutiny, with many questioning how they didn't notice one of their own students carrying a pregnancy to full term. The only sign was when in November 1996, Melissa had told her boyfriend John she was late, but according to a close friend of the couple, Tim Hoban, she had dismissed this as a false alarm only days later. Her parents, John and Marie, were also completely in the dark. They said they couldn't understand why she would have lied to them, as they would have supported her no matter what. On the 24th of June, just weeks after the murder, Melissa was arrested for killing her newborn son at her prom. She was released on a $50,000 bond, but the public were out for blood, with many championing the death penalty. The Drexlers received death threats and hate mail on a daily basis, and many of Melissa's friends vowed they would never speak to her again. Weirdly enough though, John Lewis, her boyfriend and father of the deceased child, didn't quite feel the same. According to friends of the pair, John didn't blame Melissa for the death of the infant. In fact, he said he felt sorry for her and was even discussing the possibility of marriage when she got out. When court proceedings began in the summer of 98, there were some really strong opinions out there about this case. You either felt one way about Melissa or the other. To some, she was a heartless child killer, and to others, she was a scared, silly little girl who made an awful mistake. 
But according to the physical evidence, this was no accident. A psychiatric assessment would show that Melissa was suffering from a dissociative disorder common in young women who commit neonaticide. Neonaticide is the murder of a child within 24 hours of its birth. It begins with a little bit of denial when they miss that first period. I can't be pregnant, I've got plans, and this is not in those plans. Then, as they start to experience more severe symptoms such as sore boobs, nausea, weight gain, they slip deeper into that dissociative state, convincing themselves that as long as they're able to hide the symptoms, no birth will ever actually take place. The final trimester and the labour are truly the most dangerous times for the infant, as the belly gets harder to hide and the mother finds it more and more difficult to ignore that she's pregnant. In some cases, girls will wrap their boobs and stomach with bandages or recruit someone, often the father of the child, to apply pressure to the belly in order to flatten the bump. She will rarely think about the impact that this will have on the child's physical health as in her state of mind, this is a foreign entity, the cause of all these problematic symptoms and she just wants it to go away. This kind of dissociative thinking is also why investigators believe that Melissa found it so easy easy to apply pressure to her son's neck before coldly discarding him in a trash bin. Air in the infant's intestines proved that Melissa's claims that he was born blue and non-responsive were completely false. In reality, she gave birth picked the child out of the toilet bowl and cut the umbilical cord on the serrated edge of the metal sanitary bin. It's likely he let out a little cry and all of a sudden this thing that she'd been concealing for nine months was threatening to expose her and ruin all of her plans and she couldn't have that. In that moment, she made the decision to get rid of it, wrapping the child in several trash bags before disposing it in a nearby bin. In her mind, that was it, problem solved, she can move on with her life, when in reality, she'd just coldly murdered her own child. Melissa's defense attorney argued that because of her fragile mental state, she could not be held responsible for her actions that night. Prosecutors stated that Melissa Melissa had ample opportunity to come forward about the pregnancy. She made the conscious decision over and over again not only to lie to her parents but to lie to herself. Growing up she was described as emotionless, calm and collected and she indeed carried that into her pregnancy. After she murdered her son she ran onto the dance floor to request a Metallica song for her boyfriend John. They painted the picture that Melissa, after spending all day getting dressed up, up and paying $76 for her prom ticket wouldn't allow anything to stand in the way of her enjoying her night. The lyrics of the tune she requested didn't really help Melissa's case either, with one line stating, new blood joins this earth and quickly he's subdued. Through constant pain disgrace, the young boy learns their rules. Another verse may explain how Melissa was feeling about her own emotional state that night. What I felt what I've known never shined through in what I've shown. Never be, never see, won't see what might have been. But of course we should take that with a grain of salt because we all know in the true crime community that a love for metal does not make you a serial killer. After the prom, Melissa's close friends said that she had assured them that she didn't take the child's life. In fact, she said she was so freaked out because he was born blue and not breathing. Again, this theory was debunked by the medical examiner and soon the gravity of the situation started to weigh on the now 20 year old and her family. If Melissa was found guilty of first degree murder, she could be looking at up to 50 years behind bars. Was she really willing to take that risk when she'd already been dubbed killer prom mom by the media? No. No, she was not, and on the 29th of October 1998, Melissa Drexler pled guilty to the lesser charge of aggravated manslaughter. She was sentenced to 15 years in prison, but would be eligible for parole 
after only two. John and Melissa split after the sentencing, but he still remains close to the Drexler family. Whilst incarcerated at the Edna Mahan Correctional Facility in New Jersey, Melissa worked towards a career in fashion. She continued her education, taking fashion design courses behind bars. On the 26th of October 2001, Melissa was released from prison and hoped to start a new life altogether, something she wouldn't have been able to do had she committed her crime just a few days later. You see, three days after Melissa did what she did, the No Early Release Act took effect. This meant that individuals convicted of violent crimes must serve at least 85% of their sentence. So luckily for Melissa, she narrowly avoided having to spend an extra nine years in prison. Upon her release, the now 23-year-old was spotted around town catching up with loved ones and grabbing a cup of coffee. Publicly, she never appeared emotional or remorseful for the awful events that transpired that night. It does leave you wondering, was this because of her dissociative disorder or was she simply just a cold-blooded killer who got a really light sentence. I guess only Melissa knows the answer to that. She's since gone on to build a really nice life for herself, meeting a new guy and having two kids with him. In 2016, Radar Online posted personal pictures from Melissa's Facebook account on which she stated she was excited about trying for a third child. There appears to be no bad blood between Melissa and her former baby daddy, John, as the two will often complement each other's beautiful families on social media. The Drexlers did hold a small funeral service for the child Melissa and John once shared, even naming him Christopher. And with that, they hoped that everyone could move on and start afresh. Unfortunately for them, everyone else wouldn't be so forgetful. Melissa's story became a cautionary tale for parents all over the US, saying that if you don't keep an eye on your daughters, eventually they're gonna find themselves in some deep trouble. Girls joked with their friends, warning them not to be too available in high school, or they may be at risk of having a prom night baby. The notoriety of the name Melissa Drexler would fade, but her story became an urban legend even featuring in today's popular culture. The nods to the prom mom are sometimes so subtle you might miss them, so I've compiled a few here just for you. Remember the angst-filled hit song by Nickelback, Throw Yourself Away, released in 2003? Well, with lyrics such as Babies born on a bathroom floor, her mother prays it'll never cry, but nothing's wrong, you've got your prom dress on. It's safe to say there's no question about which 90s true crime case inspired this bop. Bridesmaids from 2011 starring Kristen Wiig, also one of my favourite movies of all time, takes a slight jab at the convicted teen mom. Have fun having a baby at your prom. Even whole TV shows have been created using the events of June 6, 1997 as inspiration. This is super embarrassing. I didn't even know I was pregnant. I just thought it was the freshman 15. I thought I was having a bread baby. And finally, and probably the most controversial reference to date, would be Family Guy's prom night dumpster baby song released in 2007. So what's the obsession? Men kill women and children pretty much every damn day. So why this child? Why are we so focused on his story? Psychologists say that women are the more nurturing of the two sexes. Whether we like it or not, our hormones make it more difficult for us to end a life without any feeling. So when a young woman, a teenager no less, does something so shocking and cruel, it shakes us because it goes against everything that feels natural to us as women. It's also actually the reason why the topic of true crime is statistically more popular with the female sex. It's like we need to understand, we need to know all the facts, we're looking for that 
that aha moment, the thing that tells us exactly why this person took away the essence of another. But the sad truth is there isn't always a reason and Melissa Drexler is proof of that. She had a good core group of friends, a loyal boyfriend and her parents, albeit a little bit strict, never forced her to do anything she wouldn't want to do. So why did she lie? Why did she fall into a dissociative state in those first few crucial months of her pregnancy? The scary fact is we just don't know and we may never know. So all you can do for your little girl is raise her right, keep an eye on what she's up to and pray that she doesn't become another prom mom. I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Please give it a big thumbs up if you did. It really helps this wee channel of mine. There are some amazing charities out there who specialise in relationships with young mothers and young mothers in toxic situations. If you need to, please click on the link in the description box below. I will see you guys very, very soon, maybe from a different location in this room, depending on how far along in the process we are and thank you so so much for being patient and waiting on me I love you all to the moon and back so remember to lock your doors don't talk to strangers and always keep an eye on your little girls see ya <laughs>